Hi, everybody. Rick DiClemente, welcome to Astrology Unplugged. Nice to have you with us. I was wondering whether tonight we'd be canceling or not because we are competing. I guess some people are competing with us with the Senate hearings. So would you rather hear us or would you rather hear a Senate hearing? Hmm. <laughs> I don't think it's much of a choice, but uh, I'm taping it for anybody that's missing it. Let me get this ready to go here. Hold on. Um, mute all. Okay. All right. Tonight I have chosen, I do this now and then, I've chosen five personalities that I've considered to be enigmatic and also charismatic. And I chose um, John Lennon, the number one person I chose in the group of Gandhi. Uh, and his book just arrived today, so I've got 700 pages to read. Um, Johnny Depp, just because what's he going through? You know, what's he going through? So I'm trying to get different types of people to show you what the planets are doing to people that cause these things. Um, Marilyn Monroe, because she just, she's just irrepressible. She just keeps coming up, you know, uh, throughout history. And uh, why is that in the chart? The power's got to be in the chart. Uh, Elon, Elon Musk is going to be on the show tonight too. Um, his chart, but there's nobody, there's nobody you can touch like Gandhi's chart. I mean, I have seen charts that people claim to be Jesus Christ. And I've seen one in particular that looks really possible, probable, and it's just astounding. Uh, and I'm not comparing Gandhi to him, but I am saying that they're two really remarkable charts. When you see Gandhi, you won't believe it. Now, I'm just starting his book, so I'll know a lot more about the trials and tribulations and the diff different sub patterns that he went through, but I'll just show you enough to get started. Okay. Mr. Gandhi. All right, there he is. Let you stare at that for a while. October 2nd, 1869. I don't know where poor Bandar India is, but it's um, 4.38 in the morning, birth time. Hmm, that's really interesting. No, I'm sorry, 7.45 in the morning, 7.45. So if you're born around sunrise, the sun is always over here. This is where the sun rises over the, this is actually the ascendant. This is, this is the Eastern horizon when you see the sunrise. So the sun had just risen and Mercury rose behind it. You couldn't see Mercury because it's too bright. And maybe you could see the moon, but you certainly couldn't see Uranus, Jupiter, and Pluto. These planets were all on the opposite side. This is just an unbelievable chart. I'm gonna show you why. So when you have a Libra personality like this, this is usually not a person who has universal power has done something on a universal scale. It's not happening because he was a Libra. The Libra part of him made him bend everything and bend his powers towards social justice, social change. That's the heart of Libra, yes. But you're gonna see much more there when you compare to other thousands of charts that are out there. So you see his moon is in Leo. And that's really, really good because it's up in the 10th house. And the 10th house has Leo rise, Leo at the mid-heaven. So he's got a big ego. So he's not just sitting here, you know, uh, spinning wool. He's not just sitting here um, being a Mr. Nobody. He's manipulating. This guy is a big time manipulator. Big time, big time, big time. 
but there are scales of manipulation. There are scales that humans can do, and there are other levels of manipulation that can only be done by the masses, by the collective itself. And this man was an example of the collective working through him. Astounding chart. Okay, so, the moon is in Leo and it's really good because the Libra sometimes they'll suffer from not having enough self, not enough self. Uh, and the moon in Leo gives you a lot of self. So that can be really good. It has to be balanced just right. The Venus and Mars are both in Scorpio. The Venus and Mars are both within two degrees. They're both in the first house. This gives him tremendous pizzazz just tremendous pizzazz. And you did not argue with this man. It just wasn't possible. He was absolutely unyielding. You didn't argue with him. And when a planet's right there rising, right there on the ascendant, it's tremendously powerful. He's got Mercury in Scorpio. So the man is 90% Scorpio, 10% Libra. Well, maybe not that. Maybe about 60% Scorpio, 20% Libra, and then other things. But he's got the Venus, Mars, and Mercury, and the rising sign. Tremendous amount of Scorpio energy. Now remember, we're going to be following Eris because nobody else is doing it. We may as well, because Eris is a planet in the natal chart. It's in, in transiting too, but in the natal chart, Eris is a planet that just will not put up with injustice. It won't do it. It just won't put up with it. Now, it may be suppressed in your chart. It may be wild in your chart. It may get crazy in your chart, but when it's used and when it's tapped into, look what he did. Brought down the British Empire. I worked for a man for 10 years who was a filmmaker in India. He was like Cecil B. DeMille in India. He was the big film producer. He met Gandhi one day and he met Yogananda. He told me a little bit about meeting, but he was a very humble man. He didn't tell me enough about him. So we're gonna get in detail here. You have got the sun opposite Chiron, which is at one degree, eight degrees. So the orb is wide at seven degrees. But when it's opposite Chiron like this, and Chiron's close to that sixth house cusp, Chiron in Aries is all about being a leader. It's about being a leader. Um, and we would want to find out what happened to him at age 51 when the Chiron returned. Because when it returns, the Chiron finds its own nature. The Chiron is symbolic of the wounded healer. So oftentimes people, the Chiron placement tells you where they're weak. So what this means is in his own way of thinking, Mr. Gandhi spent his first 51 years uh, not feeling like he was recognized um, for the individual that he was. So at age 51, when the Chiron returned, I'm going to be particularly looking for that uh, when I do his chart and look at the 1920s and see what happened when Chiron returned. Anyhow, the Chiron here gives him the Virgo qualities. And I think the spinning of the yarn is very Virgoan. And the stirring up of the public is very Virgoan. But the really powerhouse, the powerhouse here is the Venus and Mars are two degrees away and they're both opposite Jupiter and Pluto. <laughs> huh? 16, 18, 10, I'm sorry, 16, 18, 20, 17. 2017, 16, 18. The midpoint between the Venus and Mars is 17 and Pluto sits right on it.
you can't even express how powerful that is. And 17, 20 is not far away. In effect, these things get so tight that you really consider these two are opposite these two, and they're making a T-square to the moon. So you got four planets making a T-square to the moon in Leo. And when you got a T-square to the moon in Leo, and it's in the 10th house, he ain't going to come down. He's Humpty Dumpty. He ain't coming down off the wall. He's absolutely unyielding. I don't care what a sun sign is. This is astoundingly, astoundingly powerful. This is so difficult. Most people could not handle this. Most people could not handle these subtle requirements from Pluto coursing its way right through your Venus Mars. This would make him, and I know there's some stories about him. I'll know more after I read the book, but this would make him absolutely impossible in relationships. He's going to have his way, period. There's no talking about it. Go get your army. I'm not talking to the army. I'm doing it my way. This is unbelievably powerful. Now, ready for this? It's unbelievable. It really is. Uh, where was Pluto when the, where was Pluto in 1948? Where was Pluto in 1948 when the British collapsed? Where was, this is his birth chart. Always like Pluto went around, round, 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 round. It's getting there, it's building up. It's, something really happened here about 1940 or so when it got close to him. Where was Pluto in 1948? You can't, you can't even express how powerful this is. The Pluto was in between the Venus and Mars and opposite the Pluto. It was opposite itself. And see, one of the things about the opposition Oppositions can be really, really, really trying in the personality, okay, because they appear to be and they are somewhat opposing forces. But with T, the T squared to the moon, you have this force going back and forth, this tremendous Armageddon, the forces going back and forth between Mars, Venus, and Pluto, and, and, and Jupiter, and all of the forces go through the moon. So the moon is the public, and I like to tell the story about him. Um, I'm not sure of the year, but it would have been near 1948 when he, he, he stirred up the people. Uh, you, John would know, you read the whole book getting near that time in 1948, as he was stirring up the British to stand up, or the Indians to stand up to the Brits. He stirred up the people to come to his house, his, his town, for a gathering, a political gathering at a certain month and time. He gave them lots of time to get there, and they came by the hundreds of thousands. And when they got there, his wife went into his tent and said, they're here to see you, to here to see you speak. And he said, I'm not going to talk. And she said, you're what? You're not going to talk. He wasn't affected at all, but he said, no, I'm not here. What did he say? I am not here to be consistent to my word. I'm here to be consistent to the truth. Something like that. And he didn't go out and talk which was his way of saying, you're gonna to have to find the power within you. I'm not the leader. Don't look to me to be your leader. You've got to express your power too, which is very Plutonian. Pluto is all about, are you a coward? Where's your courage, huh? They have very heavy duty planet. This is about as heavy duty a gulp, a gulp of Pluto that you can gulp on. So I, I want to be very interested, and I'll report back to you later 
as I find out what happened to him in his life as Pluto was getting closer and closer in 1948, and they declared themselves to be a country, and the Brits gave up. But more importantly, he did it through power. He didn't do it through force. He did it through power. And power means God's energy. You know, you can listen to all this stuff you want. And you can watch all these movies that you want and all this hype that's around in super America. Power is up there. I can't explain what it is. You know what it is. Power is up there. And, and he knew it. He harvested it. He was one with it. And what's really wonderful about what he did, he could have had a stupendous ego, but he didn't. And that's what's remarkable about this chart. This chart has a stupendous ego. This could have been, you know, Jim Jones, Hitler all put together. He could have gone that way, that direction, with this kind of power needs, the kind of power needs you see in Charles Manson's chart, similar. Can I say something? Of course you can. I don't know of any president of the United States that had that kind of power. There ain't nobody in the world that has this kind of power. The only guy I've ever seen that's close, close to this is Bruce Lee. Well, no president would ever get that kind of unanimous yeah. votes from the people like he did from the Indian population. It was because, because he spoke from a place that could not be argued with. I'm, I'm going into hyperbole. I'm going into great exaggeration on this chart tonight on purpose because this, that's how rare this is. Now I don't have to show you anything else. Pluto came around and joined up with Venus and Mars, which were natally opposite Pluto. It's just so symbolic. Not only did Mr. Gandhi liberate India, he was here to liberate the world. And it's possible now, I'll have to study his chart now, what he's going through. His voice could re-echo, because we're in a very Gandhi moment now. You know, we're in a Gandhi moment where these rich farts are going to just take all the money and leave us in the dirt and gobble up everything or else we're, uh, we're going to fight them and come about. But you can't fight them with they are 15s Idiots. You can't fight them with a gun. He fought with the commonality of the man with what was right. And you see how powerful his heiress is. I can't go on enough about this. I could do two, three shows straight on just this chart. Um, you see that his heiress is at 10 degrees Pisces. It is trying to that Mercury. It is trying to that Ascendant. So you've got the you've got the power of Eris supporting the Ascendant and the Mercury when he talked. I mean, this is just so unbelievably powerful. Now I'll go into much more of this as I read the book and I make notes and see what his challenges were because it was not easy. But this this was a um, man who was barely barely human. Uh, okay, I'll come out of my stupor now. I'll come down to, let's go look at a human being for a while. What the hell got into Johnny Depp? Huh? What got into the Gemini Johnny Depp, huh? Who's made all these billions of dollars on this one movie theme here. This kind of attractive, uh, vagabond type of typical Gemini uh recluse who you can't pin down and he's got the man of many different faces and i started to track what happened when he met the amber amber dean i guess is her name and yeah let's take a look at his chart now forgive me mr gandhi but we're going to transpose into looking at <laughs> a movie star 
Oh God, America's so out of it. Honest to God. Here's Johnny Depp. Okay. Mr. Johnny Depp. Now you got a Gemini personality. You got a Mercury and Venus in Taurus. You got a T-square. I think that Mercury, Venus, and Taurus coming from Saturn is probably why he does really well as a pirate. Pirates are really good with Taurus energy. Army, he gives us that real Taurus energy. I think that makes a lot, a lot of sense. Three planets in Virgo. I mean, he's really hardworking, fairly Virgoan. One, three, and nine. So Mars is not exactly at the midpoint. Mars is one or two degrees away from the midpoint. When a planet's right at the midpoint of two others, like with Gandhi, it's just incredibly powerful, just incredible. I mean, you would play Gandhi checkers or, or chess and he would just look at you and he would just throw the board up in the air. <laughs> That's the kind of energy that uh, Bobby Fischer had. Bobby Fischer as a chess player said, I am not here to beat you. I am here to destroy you as a human being. So he said, I'm here to destroy you. Oh man, my Pluto, Mars, and his chart. That's a hard energy to sit next to. Okay, look at the bucket pattern. Look at the bucket pattern. We could say it's almost two buckets, but it's clearly a bucket pattern to Neptune. The Neptune is extremely powerful because the Neptune in Scorpio is squared to the ascendant. When a planet squares the ascendant, it's extremely powerful. Neptune is very, very prominent in two kinds of people. One, the holy people, which he's clearly not. Neptune is really prominent in movie stars, filmmakers, people that love photography, they love art. Neptune people like images, they like to live out in the ethers of the world instead of in the firm, terra firma. Okay, we get some really intriguing, powerful Virgo planets that are opposite Saturn retrograde and it's in the seventh house so this is surely an indication that he did not bond with his father something going on wrong with the father uh, even though this is a little bit wide the saturn is still opposite to uranus and where does the t square go goes to mercury he's a gemini so this man's a very stubborn man He's very stubborn. It's coming from Saturn fixed in Aquarius to Mercury fixed in Taurus to Venus fixed in Taurus to Uranus, which is a very fixed planet. So you've got a big T-square going to Mercury and it's also going to Venus. So this is why he's um, Mercury Venus is why he comes across as kind of charming, a boyish kind of cute smile. Um, you, you, you marvel at watching him at the permeable face that he has. His face is always changing through these different moods as he's going, the Gemini is just switching personalities. Okay, so you can see all that stuff. Makes a lot of sense. So I looked at his chart and he's been really famous for a long time. He's been the most beautiful man in the world for a while. All that stuff. What happened with Amber Heard? What did she bring? Well, I was looking at this and I was really studying it. And um, so Pluto, Pluto was opposite, no, sir. Pluto was on his moon. So Pluto has been going all through here his whole life. And as you know, Pluto has been in Capricorn. So when Pluto got near that moon, it was delivered to him through Miss Amber. What's her name? Amber Dean? Yeah. She was the deliverer of his Pluto transit. Now, when Pluto hits your moon, it's very confusing. When it hits your moon, it's very 
hard to ascertain what it's going to do because it's so unpredictable. It's so deep and it's so powerful. And that's the one thing Gemini's are not. We're not talking about John. John's an exception. John has too much Scorpio. John is not like most Gemini's. Most Gemini's cannot handle a Pluto transit because they're not wired and plumbed for the depths. They're just not plumbed for the depths. They're plumbed to stay on the surface and play around with the beach ball on top. That's what they're like. John's different because of his Pluto and his Scorpio energies. So when Pluto came to his moon, they came through her. Why did it come through her? Because I haven't even looked at her chart, I don't even know what she is. She came, she was a delivery woman for him to learn about his own Pluto. When Pluto comes in our life and it comes to a person, it usually is the person that's come to help us, they come to hurt us, or they may have come for both reasons. But usually what they're doing is they're trying to teach us to own our own power, to go deep inside of ourselves. And people say things like, oh, I have a relationship now. I've never known you can have a relationship like this before. That's the verbiage that you hear from people under Pluto transits. So she had that impact on me, but after a while, you could see he couldn't handle the heat in the kitchen. And most Gemini's can't. They're not made for heat in the kitchen. They're not made for it. John can handle it. If John can hang out with Carl Jung, John can handle talking about Pluto. Okay, so I started looking at it, but I wasn't that impressed with this. I saw it. And then what I did find was this, and this was remarkable. In uh, in Johnny's twelfth harmonic chart, this was just astounding. In his twelfth harmonic, okay, okay, all of this, all of this stuff. Here we go. Here's the twelfth harmonic. This is his spiritual chart. This is his spiritual history, his past life. You see a lot of Virgo, a lot of Moon Neptune. You may not know this, but Mr. Depp is a very pure individual. He has a lot of very purified, angelic, spiritual parts to him that maybe he doesn't understand. I don't know, but most Gemini can't. Uh, some can, yes. This is his spiritual chart. It's kind of well-rounded, spaced out throughout the whole chart. But what happened when the lawsuits came from her, et cetera, et cetera? Neptune was right here. Neptune was right here. Neptune was right, right opposite Neptune. You see, these things are happening to you all all the time, and you have no idea. This is why I do show number 274, to try to give you an idea. <laughs> Neptune was opposite as Neptune. Now, let's talk about that. That's really, really powerful. Okay, Neptune comes to you to teach you to let go of your humanness and to own your spirituality. Well, a Gemini personality doesn't understand that. I mean, some through history have. Some of our greater mind Geminis, um, David Hawkins, etc. But Pluto had already hit his moon. Now Neptune's here. Pluto hit his moon. Now Neptune's opposite Neptune. What do you think the GOP is going through right now? Neptune's opposite Neptune. What do you think made the GOP fall apart? 2018, like I told you for years was coming, Neptune opposed Neptune and they withered like the wicked witch. <laughs> they did. So you got Pluto coming on his moon. Let's talk about that. 
what that meant was, and you see this with other people too, like you'll see it with Trump, who's another Gemini. You'll see when Pluto comes on you, you have the opportunity to find your depth and find your power, but you have to stop effing around. It's that simple. You have to stop effing around and take life by the horns. You might you get that point? You know, it means something. Let's, I want to be something particular. I want to be something more. I want to be something with balls and with power and courage. That's what the Pluto is trying to do inside you. And when you have disasters in your life, one of my best friends died today. It's similar to this kind of energy. When you deny the energy, you start Pluto working against you. Let me rephrase that. When you deny the energy, you start your own Pluto working against you. Because there's a part of you that's very, very deep. I don't care what sun sign you are. There's a part of you that's very, very, very deep. And it's very powerful. And when you get to these stages, you're talking about nothing but God. And there's a, there's a Pluto part inside of you that when it gets tired of trying to tell you about it, it's trying to say, here's the power, summon me, I've got the energy, listen to me, I've got it. When you just won't listen to it, it just does away with you. It doesn't do away with you. The planet doesn't do away with you. You do away with yourself because you just can't handle it. You just can't handle it. So I'll guarantee you through this time, I don't care what the results were with this trial, I'll guarantee you there's a real strong chance that, that Mr. Depp was left in pieces after this trial. There's a very good chance, not only that, there's a very good chance that he'll never regain his pieces. Very possible. And I've been going over my own Pluto transits of my past to, to learn about this. And I, I think it's largely true. Then comes the long Neptune. Well, the Pluto came by to make him stronger and more passionate. And to, to you know, one of, the, one of the curses, one of the curses Gemini men and women have to face all their life, all through their friends telling them all the time, don't you have anything serious? Don't you ever have a serious relationship? Ain't you got any real deep love inside you, deep passion in you? And Gemini is just not made for it. And Gemini has to run from this kind of attacks. And it's very hard for Gemini to do it because they're not made for that kind of fighting in the depths with the depth charges in the submarines. They're not made for it. So why that's why Geminis are so known so well for being escape artists. They want to escape. They want to change subject. That's why. That's why. They're just not made for it. Give him a break. So you see the Pluto goes by. You can tell by the experiences going through this trial that things aren't looking any better. And what's happening is getting even nastier and nastier. That's Pluto. Then along comes very subtle Neptune, opposite Neptune. That was the final straw. So it may look to you it may look to the public like Mr. Depp won his trial. Mr. Depp did not win a thing. Mr. Depp had a humongous follow-up spiritual crisis that has left him devastated. Or, or he's learned his lesson and he has made us. Part of him knows that this is a spiritual Disaster. Part of him knows that this is all happening because it's a spiritual lack. Part of him knows this. Now, if he's smart enough and ballsy enough, he can take this Neptune opposite Neptune and totally turn his life around and go to India and get in some hut and change his whole life. That's the kind of powerful ne power Neptune has. But it's more likely that he doesn't learn from it. And, and it's very likely that he'll get extremely involved with alcohol and escape. And um, it's hard to tell what will happen. But it's very 
ponderable about how he may be very close to suicide. Because Neptune gives you this urge, you just want out of here. You just can't stand it here anymore. You just got to get out. You can't stand the physical plane anymore. You want out. Well, some people do it through suicide. Some people do it through affairs. They, some people do it through liquor, whatever. And some people do it through the real thing. is surrendering to God. The real thing. So he's getting his real chance now. The Neptune's all over his Neptune. He's getting his, he's getting, imagine being him and sitting there and knowing that you won, but not feeling victorious. That's got to really feel pretty weird. So I'm going to leave it go with that, but I think it's really intriguing. And I think that's what happened to him. Very interesting. See how boring astrology is? You see? People don't know that. <laughs> Am I getting laid this weekend? Oh, please. What does Cosmo Magazine say? <laughs> my chances are good. Oh, my God. Here goes Volgar Rick. The next person on the list. My God, look at this woman. Marilyn Monroe, what a chart. You got to ask yourself, what makes this woman continue to tick? What makes her so damn sexy? What makes her so innocent? What makes her to be so misunderstood? She died when she was 36. We still don't know how she died. Never will, no problem. Another Gemini. Gemini woman, you see the little kid in there. You see the little child, ne the, the Gemini, right across the ascendant. I told you these are like neon lights. Bzz, 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 bzz. Right across the ascendant, Neptune opposite the moon. Neptune opposite the moon in Aquarius is somebody who just has this electrified emotional nature but it's just it's just fronted with this tremendous sense of innocence this tremendous sense of vulnerability she eeks of it her chart's similar to lady die lady die had that kind of innocence you know what it is people talk about how sexy they both were and all that it's not what it is. It's what it looks like. People want to people want to go steal their innocence and get it back because they've lost theirs. That's what it's about. The soul can't stand the thought that it's lost its own innocence. That's why when we see babies and we go, oh, right? Huh? We're seeing pure innocence. And when you're seeing pure innocence, you're touching the God part that's in you. So she's an absolute sex pot, and she's this child who's so vulnerable. Come on, honey, I'll drive you home. <laughs> Imagine the stuff she had to go through. And the moon opposite Neptune is somebody who's really, really unsure of how they feel, and they're very vulnerable and gullible. Just very, um, they have weird taste in men. They may, she married his baseball player. You know, they, they just, they drag home these people like, where'd you get him from? They don't match. Because Neptune's just non-judgmental. It's just, it's just non-exclusionary. Oh, she liked him at the time. It was cute. He was cute. He was fun. Look deeper, this chart's amazing. You knew it had to be, because she keeps being Marilyn Monroe. Where's it coming from? It's in the chart. Look at the great big bucket pattern with the great big bucket swinging from Saturn in Scorpio. And this is retrograde. This is a guarantee when it's that aspected.
This is a T-square, and it's a bucket handle, and it's Saturn in Scorpio, and it's retrograde, and this is a guarantee that she did not get tight with her father. And she may have spent the rest of her life trying to get her father's okay through whatever she did. I don't know. But this gave her the sexiness. The sexiness doesn't come from the Pisces. It doesn't come from the Gemini. It doesn't come from the Neptune. It comes from Scorpio right there. And you can just sense what they're, just look at her picture. She's this little toy of innocence and this sex machine power. You can just see it. That's where it comes from. The chart has to have it in there in a major way for it to blow us away. We don't talk about this movie star and that movie star that much. We talk about her all the time. You know, it's everything about Marilyn Monroe, the idol. This is where it comes from. Now, I was looking deeper into her chart. She died um, August the 5th of 1962. When the Neptune is involved as it is in the birth chart. Okay, when the Neptune is involved like it is this strongly, that's always one of the things you need to think about. Confusion around drugs, deception around drugs. Was she killed? Was she poisoned? This is very, very common with Neptune, okay? Now remember that with a bad astrology, you're gonna hear all this worldly stuff. And with a good astrology, you're gonna hear what's really going on. What's really going on, she's trying to make her way back to God. Like we all are, she's trying to find her way back to God. So she's obviously taking this lifetime, thinking that she needs to be more um, flexible, more gullible, more, more open, more innocent even though she's got the tremendous Saturn and Scorpio. So what do we see in her past life chart? Here it is. What do we see in her past life chart? In the past life chart, this is how she felt about herself before she took the lifetime in 1926. She's got Pluto opposite Venus across the ascendant, T squared to Mars. These are the two sex planets, Venus and Mars and Pluto. So what do you think she thought about herself sexually when she took her life? I don't know what it was, but I'll tell you right now, there's no doubt that these 12th harmonic uh, chart cases work without a doubt. She's got some kind of issue sexually, whether she was a, a rapist, whether she was raped, whether it was whatever whether she was greatly confused about what her sexual role was. We don't know if she was a man or a woman in the past lives, doesn't matter. But you can see in the past lives, it's all about the sex drive and getting the sex issue resolved. And how did she wanna resolve it in this lifetime? It just makes total sense. How did she wanna resolve it in this lifetime? She wanted to resolve it by becoming more safely more safely, uh, moon up is in Neptune. Jupiter and Neptune are the two spiritual planets. So you can see it, but what she do with that sexuality? Buddy, she took a grip right on it, right? JFK had a moon in Scorpio, he's a Gemini. His brother was a Scorpio. So she sucked up Jupiter, uh, Scorpio energy to, her, to herself. She drew it to herself. But anyhow, I think it's a really intriguing chart um, because the number one reason is we keep projecting onto her that she's the item. She's not the item. She's not the item. 
your own sexuality is being seen through the lens of your godliness, through your purity, through your own innocence. All those things are stirred when you see someone like her. You see someone like her and you go, well, where in the hell? You don't see anybody like that anymore. Somebody that's that unbelievably striking and innocent, same time. Just unbelievable. You don't see it. Just a really powerful example. Are we enjoying ourselves? <laughs> Good, because I'm running out of uh, people here and uh, semi trials are going on. Now we just keep changing from one weird personality to another. So let's go to Elon Musk. Just fascinating, really. Mr. Musk. The South African. Okay, here's Elon's chart. It's kind of know where he got that first name from. This is a multi-billionaire who made his billions through technology. Look at Uranus opposite Eris. Look at Uranus opposite Chiron. These are these are the two planets. Chiron and Uranus are the two planets that make an astrologer. This guy would be an incredible astrologer if he wanted to be, but he's overwhelmed by other forces. Now, not only is Uranus at nine, and these two are at 13, look at the powerhouse. These are both within 40 minutes of each other. Not degrees, minutes. So you've got tremendous power here with this guy. You've got the tremendous Aries potential. And what are they doing? What are they doing? This, this symbol here, this, this symbol is really strong because remember everybody from 1952 to 1989 is born with this Chiron opposition to Uranus. But what is this opposition? This opposition of somebody, this is not opposed to some piece of plywood. This is opposed to Uranus. These two wild ass planets are opposed to Uranus, which is crazy. It's crazy inventive. Let's try anything. How about I make my own moon ships? Wow, right? We'll go up in our own moon ships, whatever. But where does the T-square go? Because remember, this is the generator that just keeps going. He's got his own built-in generator that just keeps going. But where does the T-square go to? It goes to the sun. It goes to the sun. And it goes to Mercury, which is the thinker. But it goes to the sun at the 10th house at the top of the chart. And what is cancer known as? What do I keep telling you in this class? Cancer, without a doubt, is the best business person in the Zodiac. This is the richest man on earth. Now, when you've got a punctuated sun like that, it's so exaggerated, and it's the sun ruler of Leo, you're going to get phenomenal Aryans. We're not talking about Gandhi here. So he's got the arrogance. I think I'll buy Twitter. Uh, goodbye, puppy. Goodbye, some chocolate. Now let's buy Twitter. So you see the generator, which means the way out of this continual fight is through the sun. So it's through acquisitions. Keep acquiring. Keep getting bigger. I'm a bigger Humpty Dumpty. I'm a bigger Humpty Dumpty. I'm on a bigger wall. I'm on a bigger wall. He's not learning because the only way you learn is when you just start giving it to God. That's the only way out of it. It's the only way, the only way to get out of all this stuff. Christ told us that. The Bible tells us that. All the other good books tell us that. But whatever, people have to learn at their own time, you know. And we're in a real good country to learn this kind of lesson. Okay. So while this is all going on, what's really happening in Mr. Musk's char, let's go to his 12th harmonic. Why do you take a lifetime with such superpower? Why do you do such a thing? 
Let's go and look at his 12th harmonic. Okay. I have to sit here and entertain myself. Okay, 12th harmonic. There's a 12th harmonic. Let's put it on your screen again so you can see it. Okay, here it is. Now remember this 12th harmonic is distilled. This is your chart of how you feel about God, how you feel about yourself and your chances to get back to God. It's that simple. It's what it is. Well, look at his chart. He's got a really arrogant sun right there rising right opposite Mars. You're not going to tell me what to do. I know what the hell I'm doing, right? Jupiter's up here nicely put in Pisces. It's opposite Eris. Jupiter, Eris, Sun, Mars. So this tells me very clearly that this is a guy who is interested in spirituality, but he can't understand the difference between his own ego success and his own spiritual success. He just can't separate the two. A Sun and Cancer is not built for that, most of them. So what does he do? He's, he's confused about his own ego success. So what's he do? He comes in and he takes another lifetime where he's the richest man on earth. Well, that'll do it. That'll fix things. He's going to buy. He's going to buy the pearly gates. So I don't think so. So here's the Jupiter Neptune. This is what I'm always telling you about. When these two are conjunct, they are magnificent symbols of somebody who's really spiritually oriented, usually. But when they're opposite Saturn, I don't believe it. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, I don't. So that's what's going on in this guy's head. I don't care what you see as he's put down the billions on the poker table. Okay, what you're seeing, this guy's going through ping pong, ping pong about having tremendous faith in God and having none. And he doesn't know what to do with it. So he'll buy, he'll buy uh, Twitter. Well, by God, if you buy Twitter, you should have enough answers. Right? Any question you got. So it's pretty intriguing. Pretty intriguing chart. Be interesting to watch what happens to him. Okay, we've done four. John Lennon's next. You got any questions so far of what you've seen? Any questions or comments on what you have seen? Anything that stood out? Anything that made your mouth go? Come on. Anybody? What do you think will happen with Johnny Depp if uh, Amber Amber um, appeals? First of all, I don't think Amber exists. She's just a figment in his mind that's playing out the Pluto and the Neptune. What do I think he's going to do? I think he's going to come really, really, really close to just losing it. You got to remember, there are two signs in the zodiac, maybe three. Let's say three. There are three signs in the zodiac that have no self control. There are three signs in the zodiac that don't have any self control. Why? Because they don't have any self control. They're not like Taurus, they're not like us Capricorns, they're not like Virgos. Geminis, Sagittarius, Pisces. That doesn't mean all of them. Geminis, Sagittarius especially. They don't have any, they even put up a Christmas tree and everything, you put, you put the limbs and they stick to the middle. Well, they're putting up the Christmas tree. They got nowhere to put it to. There's no center bar. There's no center core. That's what happens with Sagittarius. 
Read what a Sagittarian has to say someday. Listen closely to what a Sag is trying to tell you. You tell me if you make any damn sense out of it. It's unbelievable. Look up some of Jimi Hendrix's lyrics as a Sag. What the hell was he talking about? It's very, very common. They're so interested and built for exploring and going out and going over the fence and the, the firework and going to other countries. They're so, they're so interested and intrigued with broadening, expanding, that they don't have a thought about condensing and centering. And that's why, again, John's a bad example because John has the Gemini in him. He has those qualities, but John has the Scorpio in him. So he's constantly bringing it back to the center. He's able to. But those three signs, it's very, very common that they just lose it because they don't have any control. They have nowhere to build it. They, they can't, you can't buy it. You can't build it. You can't construct it. You can just live through more lifetimes. I have a question. Yeah. Okay, so why, when you have a personality like Elon Musk, who has tremendous ego, tremendous uh, spirituality, um, and you have a Carl Jung, who the same thing, uh, Jung becomes a mystic. He has a mystical experience. Uh, Elon Musk, why doesn't he... <laughs> What, what, why, why do some people have mystical experiences and some people don't? Well, that's a really hard question. Number one, karmic stuff you just can't answer. Number two, your connection to the collective is not answerable. It's, it's going on at another level you don't even know. I don't know what made Mr. Young tick. I showed you in his birth chart what his powers are and his rare ability to express the sun and Pluto at the same time, or is the sun and Neptune, the sun and Neptune at the same time. Uh, but there's something going on in Jung's chart in his past life, because it all goes back to the 12th harmonic and you feel less than, so you're gonna take a life so you can fix it. You come out of a lifetime, you feel less than in God's eyes. You think you think you know what's wrong. Astrologers can help you identify what they think is wrong. So you start on a course of fixing everything and you end up finding out you don't have to fix anything because there's nothing wrong. That took me 44 years to figure that one out. I've gone full circle. I don't even need astrology anymore. I've gone full circle. There is no reason for it anymore. If I can sit down and figure out what's wrong with me, what's wrong with you, how to fix it, so what? Why fix it? Well, I don't need to fix it. So it's pretty heavy duty. So let's take Jung's chart, for example. You're, you're asking a really very good question, John. Here's Jung right here. We were looking at him earlier. Let's take his harmonic. Let's look at his 12th. Okay. Now these 12th harmonic theories are all mine. I don't know anybody working with this except me. Okay, and this is Mr. Young, and I knew it'd be fascinating. So let's take a look at his 12th harmonic. This is his spiritual transcript. All right. At the top of his chart, he's got Capricorn, Capricorn, Capricorn. And this tells me, without a doubt, Sun, Neptune, whoa. This tells me that when he had a dream, or when you had a dream, he didn't tell you what it might mean. He didn't tell you what to consider. He told you what it does mean, period. Jung did that. That's not what it means. This is what it means. Who in the hell can do that? Three Capricorn planets at the top can do it. This is magnificent, powerful. And only people that have planets like this, uh, and to me, in my experience, these are people who've had tremendous uh, advances at the soul level. This guy is really way down, way down the line. Okay, and he's, he's withstanding sun next to Neptune, even though it's in Taurus, still Neptune. 
So he's got all this Earth, and then he's got Neptune right there. Give him Aries rising, okay. Give him three planets in Virgo. Give him this phenomenal grand trine. Sun, Neptune, Mercury, Eris, Uranus, Pluto, Jupiter, Saturn. He's got eight planets in one grand trine. This is somebody who has just unbelievable harmony within himself. And that means that he's worked so hard. He's just worked so hard to achieve that harmony. You see, he's figured it out. And, and therefore I say to you, it's, it's not that Young has the answers. Young is the answer. Does that make any sense? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. if you read his books, he's not airing it. He's not arguing with you because I think I'm different and my opinion's right, yours is wrong. He's just telling you how it is, how it isn't, and how it is. And how do you argue with this guy? Freud tried it. You couldn't get anywhere. You but, can't argue with a guy who just knows. And that's what his birth chart is. His birth chart just knows. The ego in him, he was a doctor and he would say, anybody who thinks I'm a mystic is an idiot. I'm a scientist. Bullshit. You see, I disagree with it. I think he thinks he was a scientist. He was a damn mystic. He was, he, he didn't want anything published until he was just dead. I know. Well, it's talked an awful lot, like Einstein did. You know, Einstein said, I'm not a scientist. I'm a mystic, more or less. So anyhow, I think your answers are there now. I think your answers are, are plentiful and they're right in front of you now. Um, in the answer to Mr. Musk, when you look at his past life, you don't see the accomplishments. You don't see the spiritual advancement that's been built and made and succeeded. You just don't. That's all. I'm not judging either man, but uh, he's going to go on to do some things. He just thinks it's all, he, the problem with Musk is he thinks it's all, the answers are lying in technology. And they don't. You and I know the answers lie in sitting on the log at a campfire with your buddies, having a beer and laughing. That's where the damn answers are. That's where they lie. Get a log, let's get a campfire, let's tell some stories and laugh our butt off. Next, John Lennon. Oh boy, we saved the best for last. I don't know how he got into my group, but he did. Okay, pretty interesting chart, really. Okay. The young man who lost his mother when he was very young. Let's not look at Eris and what do we find? Well, bucket pattern to the moon. A bucket pattern to the moon, making him very cancerian. He's a Libra, and the sun is right next to the descendant. So the sun is big, and he did have a big ego. He's not all what these people crack him up to be with his imagined song. He's not Mr. Peace. He was Mr. Get Me the Attention. Listen to George Harrison talk about what it was trying, what it was like trying to get one of his songs submitted past Paul and, and John. <laughs> Past their two egos. He talks a lot about it. He was very Cancerian because the moon is at the top of the chart. Look what happened to him when he met a woman named Yoko. Look what happened to his life. It all totally changed. And that's indicated by the powerful moon opposite Pluto. Three degrees, less than one degree. Moon opposite Pluto, T squared to Mercury and Scorpio. Moon opposite Pluto. First of all, it goes along in the 10th house and the 4th house. The moon and Pluto is impossible to describe, but what it means is which between him and his mother, it goes back to other lifetimes, between him and his mother, there was never a healthy separation from this is mom, this is me. Sometimes it's somebody living vicariously to the other. 
Sometimes it's actual uh, incest. Sometimes it's emotional incest. It can be all kinds of things. But have you ever heard his song that he sang called Mother? He just screams his brains out. Mama just screams his brain. It's like primal scream. So it's not like a Libra to have mama issues, but he did. Moon Pluto people are very difficult to figure out, but you can usually assume that the, in, the emotions are not healthy and the emotions are highly involving women or the mom. So I will guarantee you when he found that very strong woman, Yoko Ono, very strong Aquarian, that he latched onto her emotional strength. Who in the world could imagine the Beatles sitting in there playing songs and Yoko sitting in the background on the couch? Who in the world would ever believe that would have ever happened? The most private of private. They're there with George Martin, their producer. And she's sitting there and she's telling John, well, I think you need to turn your volume up a little bit. And maybe, John, you need to write another verse about this. It's like, oh, my God, what the hell happened there? So anyhow, a lot of intrigue in this chart really is. So we know that he's, he's um, very volatile in his chart. A lot of things I don't say to you that I should start saying that's an old word that I kind of do believe in. Uh, use this more and more. The chart promises. I really like that word. The chart promises some kind of, I don't want to say disaster, but the chart promises some really heavy duty emotional upheavals in this chart. And I think that word does fit. Now, this emotional upheaval is going on between the fourth house and the tenth house. These are the two houses of identity, okay? Who am I at home and myself? Who am I in the world? And it's the T-square going to Mercury. So we all know, and the Mercury's in Scorpio, we all know that you didn't ask him something if you didn't get a sharp-ass answer. He was extremely caustic and powerful. And um, he was ready to tell you how stupid he thought you were. He was no fool. He took the little pretty bubblegummy songs by Paul, which were just unbelievable, and just gave them more depth and more focus and twisted them into some kind of, you know, looking through a glass onion. What the hell is he talking about? I am the walrus. So he gave it depth and focus and he made it weird because Yoko was there. So anyhow, you've got the moon opposite Pluto and how does he try to solve it? How does he try to solve his emotional instability all his life? He does it through the T-square to Mercury and Scorpio to figuring other people out to figure out how do these people work? How do their minds work? It's in the seventh house, I'll show you. So he would have been an excellent, he would have been an excellent therapist, an excellent counselor with Mercury and Scorpio in the seventh house. So he was always trying to figure himself out and only in his way he did it through music. And for our benefit, he, he was a phenomenal songwriter. It's just astounding. And the son had a lot to do with it. why he wasn't a counselor. The son being close to the descendant. The son just wants to create. It just wants to sing. It wants to create. That son were not that close to the descendant. That son were down in here, or that son were up in here further. It's very likely he would have been a therapist and he would not have been a song, song maker. But it's very intriguing. He's got three Taurus planets. So he's yearning for stability. He's really trying to find it. He's got real trouble 
with the Mercury and Scorpio opposite the stiffness and the rigidity of two Taurus planets. So he's he's trying to get past his own stiffness. Where does that come from? Where does that come from? Well, I was looking at a sixth harmonic. Look at that. One, two, three, four, five planets in the ninth house in Aries. This is why he was such a leader. I mean, the government was scared shitless of this guy. The FBI had all kind of files on him. Is he going to have another sit-in? Is he going to tell all the kids to stay home? What's he going to do? He knew he was powerful. Well, what's the 12th harmonic say? What's the 12th harmonic say? All oh, ye astrologers that aren't doing ye 12th harmonics, you need to start doing them. Okay, let's see what his past life had to say. Well, and isn't this intriguing? Taurus, 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 Taurus. Virgo, Virgo, Virgo. Okay, so we see in his past life, when you have a lot of Taurus and you combine that with religion, et cetera, what it really adds up to, I have found, is it adds up to this phenomenal sense of obedience. You've got to obey. This is the Middle East. The Middle East is all this Taurus energy. By God, you got to obey or cut your head off. You just got to obey. It's that simple. And not obey, you got to do it right. Do it the right way in Virgo. So he comes out of this past life with this tremendous sense of serving. Tremendous sense of service. The sixth house. But it's got to be done exactly in a certain way. Now, this is what I've been working on for months and months and months and months and months. I will guarantee you, I don't know how it happened. I don't know enough about it. But when Mark Chapman walked down the street and shot him in the head, wasn't it Chapman? I believe it was Mark Chapman. He shot him in the head. Mr. Lennon brought that on to himself. Even though he was just reborn, he put out a double album. He talked about starting over. There was all this new brew on all this. Mr. Lennon felt like a failure because he was not serving God rigidly like the freaking rules say. And therefore you die. That's what happened to Mr. Lennon. He was not even aware of it, maybe. But there could be somewhere in some discussions he had a couple of weeks before he died, maybe with Yoko or with somebody around, maybe they're having a joint or maybe they're having a drink and they're talking about how people, if they're not obedient enough to God, they really don't deserve to live. Something's going on like this. This is how it works. We draw to ourselves. But I think we found some really fascinating charts. Some fascinating charts. And John, you can see from the juxtaposition of these that you just have the rarities are the Youngs and the Gandhis. The, the rarities. It shows up in their 12th harmonic. It shows up in charts that are hard to live with, but they make, they get, they, they survive it somehow. Your chart has to show it. If the chart doesn't show, you end up like Johnny Depp. You saw what happened to uh, Marilyn Monroe. She was all hung up on sexuality. I mean, I'm sure it was in her face at all times. 600 people hitting on her per day. Imagine what the casting couch was like. So anyhow, very good evening tonight. It surprised me because I thought we we're going to do politics. Well, it came out better than I thought. This is a 
a real good example of five different people. Uh, next week is my good friend Ksenia Moore who will be joining us on a Friday afternoon from Australia. She's really, really good. If you want to look her up on YouTube, Ksenia, K-E-S-E-N-Y-A, Ksenia Moore. She's a really fine astrologer. Very, very smart, wonderful, lovely woman but really talented. She, she breaks all the rules. She doesn't care what the rules say. She studies with people all over the world. That's how she found me. And she invited me to her show and I invited her to her. So she's very good with Vedic astrology. She's very good with Western astrology. She writes a lot of columns on the internet. She has a huge following. Um, She's following a lot of the weirdisms and the corrupt shit that's going on in the in the government in Australia at the same time we're following ours. We're going to be talking about the future. What's coming down the pike in the future for all of us on Earth? What's coming for the Americans? What's coming for the Australians? But in general, what's coming planetarily? She's not a follower of Eris. She doesn't do any harmonics. She's a Leo. She's a wonderful gal. She'll uh, be joining us next week. On the 30th, I'll be having Christine Sumner, who are, will be our second Piscean um, shaman in the past couple of months. She's pretty remarkable, doing some really interesting things. She'll be joining us on the 30th. So you guys go, go outside, go off, get the cool air. I always have to cool off when the show's over. Also want to, sorry about your loss of your friend. And, yeah. You know, you're a real teacher. Good. You love what you do and can get through the class, you know, so appreciate it very much. Well, thank you very much. She was a nurse and I, I grew up with her and uh, she was 72 and she had, two bad falls in the OR. She had two bad falls and hit her head twice. And that's what brought about her problem. And uh, just an absolutely golden person, real pure. And uh, I couldn't go see her because I didn't want to go in the hospital with all the COVID. Oh, yeah. Anyhow, thank you very much. I'm really grateful that you're all here. Now go watch the United States government, they'll make you feel better. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Bye-bye. Good night. See you next Good week. Good night. See you, John. <laughs>